Hey everyone, welcome to another installment of Harry Potter Theory. Today, we're going to be discussing the age-old question of how on earth Harry's parents amassed such an incredible amount of wealth. How is it that Harry's vault was absolutely bursting at the seams from galleons when the vault of an entire family, the Weasleys, had but just one single galleon? We're also going to be looking at why Rowling made the decision to make Harry as wealthy as he was. When the Philosopher's Stone was first released, we got our first look into the contents of Harry's vault, Vault 687, when Hagrid escorts him to Gringotts. Griphook unlocked the door, a lot of green smoke came billowing out, and as it cleared, Harry gasped. Inside were mounds of gold coins, columns of silver, heaps of little bronze canuts. All yours, smiled Hagrid, and from the first time I read that passage, I became fascinated with Harry's immense fortune. How did he get it? How much was there? And what did these immense stacks of gold coins look like? Fortunately, this scene was brought to life on screen in the release of the Philosopher's Stone in 2001, and it allowed us to finally witness, with our own eyes, exactly what Harry would have seen when he first stepped foot in Vault 687. I'd also like to point out that this scene was preceded by Harry asking, but Hagrid, how am I to pay for all this? I haven't any money. Oh, Harry. So again, I ask, where on earth did Harry's parents, who were just 21 years old when they died, get all this gold to leave for Harry? There are two components to this answer. The first involves the canon explanation for the gold, with in-depth information on where it came from, and the second involves a theory of mine that may account for why these existing stacks of gold were made even larger after the deaths of Harry's parents. Let me first dive into the former. The first thing that needs to be established is that the vast wealth came almost entirely from James's side of the family. Lily Evans was a muggle-born, and there's no evidence to support that her family had any kind of generational wealth. Bearing that in mind, who was it that started the Potter fortune? Well, according to an article on Pottermore, it all started with a wizard by the name of Linford of Stingecombe, aka the Potterer, the founding patriarch of the Potter family. The wizarding family of Potters descends from the 12th century wizard Linford of Stingecombe, a locally well-beloved and eccentric man whose nickname, the Potterer, became corrupted in time to Potter. Linford was a vague and absent-minded fellow whose muggle neighbors often called upon his medicinal services. None of them realized that Linford's wonderful cures for pox and egg were magical. They all thought him a harmless and lovable old chap, pottering about in his garden with all his funny plants. His reputation as a well-meaning eccentric served Linford well, for behind closed doors he was able to continue the series of experiments that laid the foundation of the Potter family's fortune. Historians credit Linford as the originator of a number of remedies that evolved into potions still used to this day, including Skelligro and Pepra potion. His sales of such cures to fellow witches and wizards enabled him to leave a significant pile of gold to each of his seven children upon his death. If you recognize Skelligro, well, that's because it's still used to this day, notably on Harry in the Chamber of Secrets. The function of Skelligro is to heal bones, capable of both repairing broken bones and growing back bones that are missing entirely. It is described as a dreadful tasting potion, and Harry once remarked that using it felt like having large splinters lodged in his arm. The other potion created by Linford, the Pepper Potion, is a cure for the common cold, helping to warm the drinker up. The potion was notably used in the series in February 1995 during the Triumph Wizard Tournament, when it was used on the hostages of the champions after they came out of the Great Lake. The only known side effect is that it causes steam to come out of the drinker's ears for hours on end. But Linford wasn't the only one in the family to become successful. He just kicked things off. The Potters continued to marry their neighbors, occasionally muggles, and to live in the west of England for several generations, each one adding to the family coffers by their hard work and, it must be said, by the quiet brand of ingenuity that had characterized their forebear, Linfred. Occasionally, a potter made it all the way to London, and a member of the family has twice sat on the Wizengamot. Ralston Potter, who was a member from 1612 to 1652, and who was a great supporter of the Statute of Secrecy, 
as opposed to declaring war on the Muggles, as more militant members wish to do, and Henry Potter, Harry to his intimates. And while many of the Potters were able to achieve success in their respective careers, slowly growing the family fortune, it wasn't until Fleamont Potter came about that fuel really started to get added to the fire. Fleamont was the son of Henry, and father to, you guessed it, James Potter. This of course also means that Fleamont was Harry's grandfather. Fleamont may have never met Harry, but he did live long enough to make and leave him enough gold for a lifetime. You see, Fleamont was able to take the family fortune and quadruple it by creating the family's most famous potion to date, Sleek Easy's Hair Potion. The potion was a hair potion and scalp treatment marketed with the following slogan, Two drops tame even the most bothersome barnet. It was essentially used for taming unruly hair, sleekly and fashionably styling it. The potion was notably used by Hermione when she went to the Yule Ball with Victor Crumb. In short, the immense wealth of the Potters can be attributed to centuries of sales from multiple successful and extremely prevalent potions. Given the long-standing generational wealth of the Potters, it's certainly not surprising that Harry was left with an absolute boatload of cash. But with that explanation on the table, I have a theory for how these mounds of gold may have grown even further after the deaths of Harry's parents. When Voldemort died and Harry survived, he was praised by the entire wizarding world for, somehow, taking out the Dark Lord and relieving the wizarding community of his tyranny. It was also common knowledge that Harry's parents had died in the process. I'm of the impression that thousands of witches and wizards, feeling empathy for the young boy who had lost his parents, banded together and donated additional gold to him. The exact fortune of the Potters would have been unclear to the wizarding world as a whole, so from the outside perspective, it may have looked as if this newborn child was now left with nothing, no parents and no gold. It stands to reason that the general wizarding population, overjoyed with Voldemort's defeat, would have tried to thank Harry in some way. Maybe they couldn't bring back his parents, but with enough contributors, they could certainly make sure that he was financially worry-free. We also have to consider royalties. If Harry's ancestors created famous and popular potions that were still sold during his lifetime, then it stands to reason that he would be entitled to proceeds from the sales of said potions. Furthermore, given the prevalence of these potions, I'd be willing to bet that it'd add up quite quickly. With the question of how Harry obtained gold out of the way, the next thing I want to address is why. Why on earth did Rowling decide to make Harry's wealth a prominent plot point? Why did she make him rich? As it turns out, she's actually answered this very question in an interview. Where does Harry get his money? He always seems to have some. Does he have a bank account? Where is it? Where's his money? Well, as you know, Harry's bank account is in Gringotts. His money came from inheritance, from his father. But I think, on a deeper level, Harry's money never really is that important in the books, except that he can afford his uniform and so on. On the other hand, I think I really gave him a fortune because I was so broke when I wrote the first book, and it was wishful thinking that I would not have to worry about such things. Rowling wrote Harry as rich because, in the world that she lived in, she had nothing. This was in the beginning of the very first Harry Potter book, which of course means that while writing this passage, Rowling had no publisher, no money, and probably not a lot of hope. Writing Harry as a rich young boy, was her way of projecting her future desires, looking at Harry as an extension of herself. And that's it for this video. I hope that clarifies some questions regarding the Potter family wealth. If you have any more questions on this topic, or have any requests for derivatives of this topic, then please leave a comment down below. Until next time, remember, wit beyond measure is man's greatest treasure.